Hello, everyone. Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. Such a joy, such an honor for me to spend this time with you studying God's Word together. Nothing more important on earth than to study the written Word of God. And you can do that anytime you want to at the Scripture Verse by Verse website, which is found at the Bible Reverse, verse com. That's the Bible versebyverse.com. Just bring your Bible, click and listen. Go all the way through the Bible with me three times. Or go to any book that you want to study, any book of the Bible, click and listen. It's totally up to you. But whatever you do, study God's Word. Let's pray and ask His blessings on today's study. And Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your Word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, John chapter 18. We left off in verse 11. We'll pick it up in verse 12. Then the band and the captain and officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him and led him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that same year. Jesus actually went through two trials. This first one, before the high priest, is the religious trial. It was an attempt by the religious rulers, corrupt, ungodly sinners. It was an attempt to find him guilty of blasphemy and heresy. In other words, they wanted to accuse him of claiming to be God and, of course, teaching that which is false. Heresy and blasphemy, that's their goal. 14. Now Caiaphas was he who gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. And if you were with me, um, several programs back, you know what this is referring to. Caiaphas, being the high priest, was in charge of the spiritual life of Israel. And uh, as the high priest, he was the guardian, was supposed to be, it was his job to be the guardian of Israel's soul. And he squandered the most important position that any man could possibly have back in those days. The man who was called by God to lead people to heaven actually went to hell himself. The road to hell intersects everyone's life, even the most spiritually privileged. It is up to us not to take it, but to, ta but to stay on the straight road, the narrow road that follows Jesus Christ to heaven. Verse 15, And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. That disciple was known unto the high priest and went in with Jesus into the court of the high priest. And that other disciple was John the Apostle, the writer of this book. He was humble. So he was careful not to mention his name and draw attention to himself. It's not important for people to be impressed with us. It's our duty as Christians to try to impress people with Jesus. He's the one that they need to take note of, not us. Verse 16. But Peter stood at the door outside then went out that other disciple who was known unto the high priest 
and spoke unto her that kept the door and brought in P Peter. So John had to put in a word for Peter to get him into the courtyard of the high priest where Jesus was being held. Looked like a favor. Looked like John did Peter a favor. But what looked like a favor to Peter actually turned out to be trouble in disguise because he wasn't able to handle it, as we will see. 17, then saith the maid that kept the door unto Peter, Art not thou also one of this man's disciples? He saith, I am not. Amazing. Peter was willing to fight several soldiers with a sword in the Garden of Gethsemane, but he caves before a little servant girl. Bravery in the physical realm doesn't transfer into bravery in the spiritual. They're two different things entirely. Spiritual warfare is a whole different ball game, and it is won through prayer. Unfortunately for Peter, he didn't pray in the garden when Jesus told him to do that. He slept. So he may be tough as nails physically, but he is a weakling spiritually because he didn't pray. And that's why he cowers, he caves before this servant girl. Verse 18. And the servants and officers stood there who had made a fire of coals, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves. And Peter stood with them and warmed himself. Peter is hanging out with the Lord's enemies, and he is trying to hide the fact that he is a follower of Christ. Now, of course, there's only one way to hide the fact that you're a follower of Christ, and that's to live like the world and talk like the world. And at that point, you are no longer a follower of Christ. You are a follower of Satan. You have to choose. The Bible says it again and again. Choose you this day who you will follow. Can't have it both ways. Verse 19 the high priest then asked Jesus of his disciples and of his doctrine. You know, they really do not have a, an actual case against Jesus. So they are trying very hard to invent one. They have him arrested, and now they're trying to invent a case against him. They question him about his disciples and about his teachings. And they are hoping that they will be able to twist the information that Jesus gives them and make it look as if he is violating the law of Moses in some way. They're looking for a loophole to convict Christ. And if, and if they can get him talking, perhaps he will slip up and they'll be able to twist his words to use against him. Verse 20, Jesus answered, I spoke openly in the world. I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple where the Jews always resort, and in secret have I said nothing. So, you know, they're asking him all sorts of theological questions, all sorts of questions about what he teaches, and, and about his disciples, I suppose, what they taught. And Jesus responds by saying, my teachings are no secret. Why are you asking me? It was a stupid set of questions that they were asking Jesus because they already knew what Jesus taught. They were well aware of the things that Jesus was saying in public. 
They tried to kill him several times because of the things that he said. There was no need for this interrogation at all. This was just an attempt to twist his words so that they could falsely accuse him. 21. Jesus says, Why asketh, why asketh thou me? Ask them who heard me, what I have said unto them. Behold, they know what I said. In other words, bring in some honest witnesses. You want to know what I taught and what I teach? Bring in some honest witnesses. There are plenty of them out there. They're all over the place. Jesus had thousands upon thousands upon thousands, maybe millions of people who heard him in the last three years. And his message was always consistent. Bring in some witnesses. Some honest ones. And of course, the religious leaders will never do that because they're not interested in truth. They're not interested in the testimony from an honest witness. They're not, they're not at all interested in justice, so they're not going to bring in any of the witnesses that heard him teach. 22. And when he had thus spoken, one of the officers who stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Answerest thou the high priest so? Hmm. Is that any way to talk to the high priest? Real indignant against Jesus. How dare you speak to the high priest like that? And if they would have taken a truth pill, they would have said, how dare you speak truth to a snake? How dare you give truth, Jesus, to snakes? Because, you know, they don't, they don't appreciate it. And none of, these, none of these people did, obviously. Jesus spoke the simple truth. He didn't blaspheme. He wasn't disrespectful. He gave a simple answer, truthful answer, and they slapped him. And that's what happens when you give truth to somebody who's not interested in truth. More than not interested, hates it. Get ready for a kickback. That won't be pleasant. The words that Jesus spoke made perfect sense. But because the rulers didn't want to bring in any witnesses, they had no way of responding to his suggestion. So they just slapped him. People who are caught and don't want to repent and don't want to confess usually abuse the one who exposed them. Beat the messenger if you don't like the message. You're backed into a corner and you know that you don't have a leg to stand on. You've been confronted with truth and you can't lie your way out of it. So what do you do? If you don't want to repent and you don't want to confess, you attack the one who pointed out your lies Happens all the time. 23. Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why smitest thou me? Their lack of interest in the truth is obvious, and it should be embarrassing to them. They could not prove Jesus' guilt. They had absolutely nothing to say. So they slapped him for speaking the simple truth. Not interested in truth, so they slapped him for speaking it. And the leaders don't know it. But they are the ones who are actually on trial here. And it's very clear that they are guilty by how they're treating God and because of their disdain for the truth. They're the guilty ones. They're on trial. 24. Now Annas had sent him bound unto Caiaphas, the high priest. Annas was the former high priest. 
Caiaphas, the current high priest, and John did not record the trial before Caiaphas. So notice verse 25. And Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. They said therefore unto him, Art not thou also one of his disciples? He denied it and said, I am not. The desire to be accepted by the world is a spiritual killer. And that was Peter's problem. He had a desire right now to be accepted by the world. He had a desire to be on friendly terms with sinners. And that's why he sold Christ out. That is a spiritual killer. And you know, there is no, there is no middle ground. If Peter says, yes, I am a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, then they don't like him. If he says, no, I'm not his disciple, then Peter is accepted by sinners. It's that cut and dry. It's the way it always says. You're either accepted by God or accepted by sinners. And right now, Jesus is not as important to Peter as Peter is. Peter is more important to Peter than Jesus is important to him. And that's why he denies him. And any time you and I sin as Christians, the bottom line is this. We do it because at that moment, we are more important to us than Jesus is. And that's why people commit sin. Sin is saying, Jesus, I don't care what you want. I don't care about you as much as I care about me. It's a terrible thing to think about if you're a Christian. And yet, really, that's what it boils down to. And that's what it boiled down to Peter. He cared more about himself than he did about Jesus. He cared more about his popularity than he did about standing with Jesus with the truth. Happens all the time. Happens all the time with many modern preachers. They care more about popularity. They care more about themselves than they do about caring for caring to take a stand for Jesus and caring what he thinks. 26. One of the servants of the high priest, being his kinsman, whose ear Peter cut off, saith, did not I see thee in the garden with him? I mean, you just don't forget the face of the man that you see cut off your relative's ear. And this guy didn't forget Jesus or Peter's face. So he confronts him. And yeah, this, this was an uncomfortable situation for Peter to be in. His faith is being challenged. His loyalty to Jesus is being challenged. And oftentimes when that happens in this world, it's not a fun place to be in. But it's also an opportunity to take a stand for Jesus. 27. Peter then denied him, denied again, and immediately the cock crowed. This would have been a real good time for Peter to say, Yes, I did that stupid thing. I cut off that man's ears. But did you see? how Jesus put it back on. See, it would have been a perfect time in this stressful situation to speak up for Jesus. Could have been a powerful testimony. It would have taken spiritual courage. But instead, he denies Christ for the third time. Always remember, as Christians, our circumstances can be used by God or by the devil. They can be used to either honor Christ 
or dishonor him, depending on how we react to those circumstances. And actually, every moment is an opportunity to serve God or our flesh or Satan. 28. Then led they Jesus from Caiaphas unto the hall of judgment, and it was early. And they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. These hypocritical religious rulers, they won't step foot into a Roman palace because that would make them ceremonially unclean. And if they are, then they can't celebrate the Passover, which is about to take place. Meanwhile, they think nothing of slapping the Son of God in the face and pondering his murder. Verse 29. Pilate then went out unto them and said, What accusation bring ye against this man? Notice how Pontius Pilate is already caving to these religious rulers. He goes out to them so they don't have to come in to him and be ceremonially defiled according to their religion. 30. They answered and said unto him, If he were not a male factor, we would not have delivered him up to thee. Hmm, isn't that interesting? Let's read 29 and 30 again. Pay careful attention. Pilate then went out to them, Jesus' accusers. They dragged Jesus before their kangaroo court. And now they drag him before Pilate. And they accuse him. And Pilate comes out and says, I don't have anything to say against this guy. I have no accusations. What's their response? Did they list all of his accusations? No. They answered and said unto him, If he were not a male factor, we would not have delivered him up unto thee. Notice how they dodge Pontius Pilate's question. They totally ignored it. In essence, they say, Well, just take our word for it, Pilate. He's guilty. Don't ask us stupid questions like, what has he done wrong? Just rubber stamp our verdict so that he can be executed. 31. Then said Pilate unto them, Take ye him and judge him according to your law. The Jews therefore said unto him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death. Rome ruled the nation Israel, and Rome was the only one who could order the execution of a criminal. And the Jewish leaders, they will not settle for anything less than that. 32. That the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spoke, signifying what death he should die. In Matthew chapter 20, verse 19, Jesus predicted that he would be delivered up to the Gentiles to be killed. The Jews are delivering Jesus up right here. 33. <clears throat> then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? So Pilate has a private interview with Jesus right here. And he is especially interested in the charge that Jesus claimed to be a king. Pilate can't overlook that one because he could get in trouble with Caesar if he does. Caesar demanded to be everyone's king with no rivals. So Pilate asks, are you a king? And implicit in his question is, are you stirring up rebellion against Caesar? 34. Jesus answered him, sayest thou this thing of thyself or did others tell it thee of me. Did you ask me if I was a king because other people planted that thought in your mind? 
planted the idea that I was plotting rebellion against Caesar? Is that why you asked me? Or did you have some evidence that I'm plotting to overthrow Rome? And if Pilate thinks about Jesus' question, he will know that Jesus has been slandered. No one should act on rumor or because someone with an agenda says that something is true. Verse 35, Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priest have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? By dodging Jesus' question, which he did, and saying, am I a Jew? Pilate is in effect saying, no, I have no evidence, no knowledge of you plotting to overthrow Rome, because if he did, he would have said something about it when Jesus challenged him. He dodged Jesus' question, just like the Jews dodged his question. Verse 36, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from here. Christ is a king, sure enough, but not the type of king that was a threat to Rome. Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. It is not physical. And it's not concerned with borders. It is spiritual. Jesus is king of every single person who repents and receives him as Lord and Savior. 37. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth Heareth my voice. The truth Jesus speaks of here refers to the truth about God. It refers to the truth about Christ, sin, hell, salvation, repentance, forgiveness. That's why he came into the world, to give testimony to the truth concerning these most important things. Jesus came to spread that kind of truth. So yes, Jesus is a king, and his weapon is truth. And those who love truth hear his voice, and that's how his kingdom spreads. It's not the kind of kingdom that threatened Rome. 38, Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. Pilate is a frustrated man who evidently has given up on ever finding truth. And of course, along with that, he's given up on ever finding contentment. He was a big shot ruler, but he is as empty as anyone could possibly be. And what's really pitiful is that he is staring at Jesus, the truth. He's staring at him right in his face, and he is so spiritually blind that he asks, what is truth? If you don't have a heart for truth, you won't see it. If you love your sin, if you don't have a heart for God deep down in your soul, and you don't have a heart for truth deep down in your soul, then when you hear it, you will reject it. You will scoff at it. And you will die in your sins. Out of time. Continue studying with me at the thebibleversebyverse.com. While you're there, remember, I'm not underwritten by a large church or denomination. You can be a part of this ministry 
pray for me, pray for the word, click the donate button at the top of the front page at thebibleversebyverse.com and prayerfully give as the Lord may lead. So long.